Hello and welcome to today's overview of Galatians chapter 3, coming out of our daily devotional growth book. Today we're going to be studying and continuing our study in the book of Galatians, and we're going to be focusing on what Paul is writing to the church in Galatia, and he right now is talking about, still addressing this idea of them leaning on legalism as a way of salvation, but today we're going to look at how we're saved only through faith in Christ. So this is really important for our faith. It's really important for our walk. It's going to be a quick overview today. And I pray that today, as we go through this overview, that it just gives us a deeper desire to jump in for ourselves, to go into Galatians chapter 3 and really pull out all that God has for us. So let's begin right from the top. Let's go straight away into it. So again, today we're talking about Paul addressing the issue of legalism and emphasizing the importance of faith in Christ for salvation. We're going to begin from the first section, which I want to call justification by faith. What does that mean, justification by faith? Well, let's look into it. Let's dive into verses first, and then we'll explain what is happening here. So it begins on chapter 3, verse 1. He starts off strong. O foolish Galatians, what a start. Who has cast an evil spell on you? For the meaning of Jesus Christ's death was made as clear to you as if you had seen a picture of his death on the cross. Let me ask you this one question. Did you receive the Holy Spirit by obeying the law of Moses? Of course not. You received the Spirit because you believed the message you heard about Christ. How foolish can you be? After starting your Christian lives in the Spirit, why are you now trying to become perfect by your own human effort? Have you experienced so much for nothing? Surely it was not in vain, was it? I ask you again, does God give you the Holy Spirit and work miracles among you because you obey the law? Of course not. It is because you believe the message you heard about Christ. All right, so right out the gate, Paul starts rebuking or correcting the Galatians, the Galatian people, because they started to turn away from the message of salvation by faith alone. So what they started to do is believe, and we can see this in the previous chapters as well, that there's a way to salvation through works almost like a hybrid between faith in Jesus and faith in what we can do. I thought of an analogy that um, maybe put this into perspective. Picture a stranded out in the middle of the ocean and the waters are, it's a stormy waters. The waves and the, the, the currents are going crazy all different directions. And there's really no hope for us. We're miles and miles away from shore. And we hope to get to shore and get saved by swimming to shore. Well, the truth is, we're really not going to be able to do that. But Jesus comes along on his rescue boat, on his rescue mission. And he says, jump in. I can save you. Do you believe I can save you? And we say, yes, we believe he can save us. So we jump in the boat and Jesus rescues us and he's taking us to shore. But then along the way, we say, Jesus, I think I can get to the shore myself. We jump back out of the boat. We start swimming and drowning in the currents. And there's no way for us to get to shore. Well, this is kind of the idea here. Well, Paul, why Paul is rebuking the Galatians so heavy is because they started to believe that they could swim to shore themselves. They thought that they could depend on their own works to be saved. And Paul is coming in aggressively because he wants to remind them and the church and remind us that we are not saved by anything we do ourselves, only through the uh, sacrifice and the rescue mission that Jesus came and did for us on this earth. By putting our faith in Jesus, that's how we're saved. So let's go on. Let's continue. Let's go pick up from verse 6. In the same way, Abraham believed God, and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. 
So now Paul brings in an example from the Old Testament. He brings in Abraham. He says, look at Abraham as an example. Abraham was not saved by his works. He was also saved because of faith. He brings all this into perspective. Abraham was justified. He was saved because he had faith. It says, verse 7, The real children of Abraham then are those who put their faith in God. What's more, the scriptures look forward to this time when God would declare the Gentiles to be righteous because of their faith. Okay, now why is this important? Well, the Gentiles represented, it was a, it was a term to represent and to speak on anybody who was non-Jew, non-practicing Jew. And in the religious Jews, in their eyes, Gentiles were dirty, were filthy, were unholy, were not uh, worthy to be called God, to be called God's children. So there's a lot that was, I guess, wrong in the religious leaders' eyes about Gentiles. There was a lot wrong uh, about them. But what we see here is that the scriptures look forward to a time when the Gentiles would be declared righteous because of their faith as well. And this was the time Jesus made a way for Jews and Gentiles to be declared righteous in God's eyes. And this is what was happening. So Paul's bringing all this into perspective and he's saying, this is the time we're looking at when Gentiles would be declared righteous. And it says here, God proclaimed this good news to Abraham long ago when he said this, all nations will be blessed through you. So all who put their faith in Christ share the same blessing Abraham received because of his faith. Now we can see this promise that was prophesied, that was given to the people long, long ago is finally coming to pass when all, not just the descendants of Abraham, but anyone who puts their faith in Christ would be called a child of God and would be declared righteous. It's this time here. Let's continue because this is good news for me and you. This is good news for all of us that are watching today. We can be saved through faith in Christ. Now let's pick up, let's continue from verse 10 through 14. And we're going to see how Paul argues that those who rely on the law are under a curse. So let's look at this. Verse 10. But those who depend on the law to make them right with God are under his curse. For scriptures say, cursed is everyone who does not observe and obey all the commands that are written in God's book of the law. Now that's tough. Because we know to try and get a perfect score in life, it's no task for us. A, a lot of us have already failed. And we can't go back and make up for it. Jesus is the only one who aced the test in life and who perfectly obeyed everything. But let's keep going. Verse 11, So it is clear that no one can be made right with God by trying to keep the law. Nobody. Not me, not you, not Pastor Marco, not um, our praying grandma who was so perfect. <laughs> Nobody can be made right with God by obeying the law. For the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. This is the way, I'm sorry, this way of faith is very different from the way of law which says it is through obeying the law that a person has life. Now keep going. Verse 13. This is very key. It says, But Christ has rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law. When he was hung on the cross, he took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoing. For it is written in the scriptures, Cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. Now, Paul is bringing all of this scripture. He's bringing all of this, this, uh, this prophecy and these promises all together in this moment. And he's helping us to understand that this all centers around what Jesus did on the cross for us. It's all pointing to Jesus. It's all pointing to him and his sacrifice for us. Now, we can see here that cursed is anybody who does not obey the law to perfection. But the beauty of what Jesus did is that Jesus took upon the curse on himself. Now, it goes on to say this. Through Christ Jesus, 
God has blessed the Gentiles with the same blessing he promised to Abraham so that we who are believers might receive the promised Holy Spirit through faith. Wow, this is so good. Jesus took upon himself the curse so that everyone who believes in him and puts their faith in him can be blessed and can be declared righteous. This is Jew and Gentile. This is those who are uh, born into uh, uh, a, a Jewish uh, lineage and those who are not. This is those who had a perfect track record, supposedly, and those who didn't. This is everybody. Now this puts us all in the same playing field because we all need Jesus and we can all put our faith in Jesus and be declared righteous. And we would receive the promised Holy Spirit. Now this is great news for us. Now let's keep going. Let's see in verse, verses 15 through 18, we can see how Paul explains the promise that he gave to Abraham that was based on faith and not the law. And we can see why this is true. Look at this. Verse 15. Dear brothers and sisters, there's an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or amend an irrevocable agreement, so it is in this case. Now, what's that irrevocable agreement that God made? It's here. God gave the promises to Abraham and his child. Now watch this. It says, and notice that the scripture doesn't say to his children as if it meant many descendants. Rather, it says to his child. And that, of course, means Christ. Okay, now this just got deep. What is he saying here? First of all, I just want to point out again that Paul is bringing scriptures to life. And we're talking about scriptures from the past in the Old Testament and the law that these are promises that God made. And Paul's helping us to open our eyes to see that all these promises, again, they align perfectly and they're pointing to Jesus. Now, Paul made a, uh, I'm sorry, God made a promise to Abraham that, that he, would, uh, he would give the promises to Abraham and his child. And he was speaking to Christ the promise would be given to Christ. Now it goes on in verse 17. Paul explains a little bit what he means. He says, this is what I'm trying to say. The agreement God made with Abraham could not be canceled 430 years later when God gave the law to Moses. God would be breaking his promise. So what is he saying here? What he's saying is God is still keeping his promise that he would give the blessing to his child. Jesus. And just because God introduced the law 430 years later doesn't mean that God is breaking his promise. It doesn't mean that the law replaced the promise that God gave Abraham, that we could be declared righteous and we could be saved through faith. He, he wasn't breaking his promise here when he introduced the law. Verse 18, for if the inheritance could be received by keeping the law, then it would not be the result of accepting God's promise. But God graciously gave it to Abraham as a promise. So we can see here, the inheritance was not meant to be received by keeping the law. Or in other words, we can't receive it by being perfect. God's promise is still, it was still intact, that he would give his son. And the result of, 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 accepting God's promise. God graciously gave that to us through Jesus Christ. We can be made whole. We can be saved. We can be set free. We can be declared righteous in God's eyes. We can be washed by the blood by putting our faith in Jesus. This was all part of God's original plan. His great plan was to give us Jesus Christ so that we can be saved. We can be redeemed. We can be forgiven and receive the inheritance and eternal life. This is all part of his plan. And the law was not replacing the plan. Now we can see, no, what was the purpose of the law then? What, why was it necessary? Well, we can see what the purpose was in these next verses, 19 through 25. Paul explains what the purpose of the law was and how it was really our temporary guide to, so, to show people their need for a Savior. Let's pick up from verse 19. Why then was the law given? 
Now, that's a great question. Why was the law given then? If, if, if Jesus was the promise, if Jesus was the goal, why was the law given? Well, it was given alongside the promise to show people their sins. Now, the law consisted of over 600 different distinct laws that we had to keep, and, 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 and they were very specific and very difficult, and many people, I'm, actually, I'll say, and nobody has perfected or kept the law intact in their life. So, But we can see that the law was given alongside the promise to show people their sins. In other words, to show our need for a Savior. But the law was designed to last only until the coming of the child who was promised. Who was the child that was promised? That's right. Jesus was the child. So God gave His law through the angels to Moses, who was the mediator between God and the people. Now, a mediator is helpful if more than one party must reach an agreement. But God, who is one, did not use a mediator when he gave his promise to Abraham. Is there a conflict then between God's law and God's promises? If the, absolutely not, it says. If the law could give us new life, we could be made right with God by obeying it. But if the scriptures declare that we are all prisoners of sin, uh, so we, re I'm sorry, but, but the scriptures, I'm sorry, this is what it says, but the scriptures declare that we are all prisoners of sin. So we receive God's promise of freedom only by believing in Jesus Christ. That's like the main verse there. We know this. We only receive God's promise of freedom by believing in Jesus Christ. Because the law just identifies, it shows us our need for a Savior. It shows and it reveals our, our lack of perfection. It shows our sin. It reveals it. And we can't be made, so that, that just shows us we can't be made right by trying to obey it. Because we would have to obey it to perfection in order to be declared righteous. And we've all, we've all failed at that already. Verse 23 goes on to say, Before the way of faith in Christ was available to us, we were placed under guard by the law. We were kept in protective custody, so to speak, until the day of faith was revealed. And it's funny, it's like the law watched us and was kind of guiding us and leading us like a, and I've heard some say this, like a babysitter until we could be free in faith, until we can put our faith in Christ. And it says in verse 24, let us put it another way. Uh, let me put it another way, Paul says. It says, the law was our guardian until Christ came. It protected us until we could be made right with God through faith. And now that the way of faith has come, we no longer need the law as our guardian. The law kept us in line. The law kept us from veering off so far from God. But it was never intended to make us right with God. It acted more so as a, as a guide, as a babysitter, <laughs> not a savior. So now we know the purpose of the law, but now let's look at our final section here, verses 26 through 29. We can see that Paul explains that through faith in Christ, people become heirs of God's promise. Now let's look at this. Verses 26 through 29, the last section here. For you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on Christ like putting on new clothes. I love that. We receive a new nature, a new way of thinking, a new track record. We receive uh, a, a new, I'll say this, uh, a new life overall. Our old person dies and we become new when we put our faith in Christ. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. We can see here that what Paul's explaining is that all people become children of God and are all one in Christ Jesus through their faith. 
That means Jew or Gentile. Why is that uh, uh, a distinction? Why is that comparison so important? Because again, Jewish religious zealous leaders believed that it was through acts, it was through works that they would be made right with God. But everybody, even them and Gentile, and those that were uncircumcised, those that were impure, those that didn't obey the law growing up, ordinary men, tax collectors, fishermen, all these people, crooked people, everybody, all could be made right with God by putting their faith in Jesus Christ. Jew or Gentile, male or female, slave or free. We're all on the same playing field. and We all need Jesus just the same. The final verse here, verse 29. And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs, and God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. We are, in, we are the heirs, which means that we receive the inheritance of God's promise. Not because we were born into it, but because we were born again into it. We're born again when we put our faith in Christ. And we'll receive all the promises that God has for us. So I hope this chapter encourages you to understand that our goal is not to try and obey the law and be religious leaders and tell God, God, I've earned salvation because I'm so good. Remember, we can't swim to shore. We're stuck out at sea. We need a savior and a rescuer. And that rescuer and that savior, his name is Jesus Christ. And I believe that today, as we've covered these scriptures, that our, our hearts and our minds would open to the revelation and the other understanding that Jesus is the core of the message. He is the one by which we are saved and there's no other way. So let's put our faith back in Jesus, not in our own works. Let's stop trying to earn God's love and let's just receive it freely. And from there, we can receive a new life, receive the inheritance and begin to live a brand new start, live a brand new beginning because of what Jesus has done for you. Thank you, Lord. So let's pray today, and I pray that this blesses you. God, I pray for everybody that's watching right now, God, and I pray that you would bless them, that you would help us, Lord, to understand, Jesus, that it is you and you alone that has given us salvation because of what you have done on the cross. You took upon our curse. You took upon our sin so that we can be declared righteous. Jesus, we receive that and we put our faith in you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, thank you again for watching today's overview of Galatians chapter 3. I pray that you dive into the scriptures for yourselves. Spend every day this week diving into Galatians 3. And I pray that it blesses you and our hearts will be so filled of, of joy and gratitude. And thanks for what Jesus did on the cross for us. God bless you. And, a, and have a wonderful rest of your day.